Okay, so welcome um, everybody and thank you for joining us today for this seminar. Um, before we start, just um, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules to start with so, so that everybody knows what uh, to do and what not to do. Uh, first of all, we uh, strongly encourage you to uh, keep your video on so that we see each other and we have a sense of community. Um, and uh, however, remember that this uh, event is going to be recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable with it, you can of course switch off the, the camera. Um, also remember to switch off the, the microphones if you're not speaking or presenting. Um, if you have questions, we would um, ask you to keep them for the end. So we will have um, a long um, Q and A uh, session after the, the the speakers have done their interventions. So please keep your questions for um, after the interventions, and um, you can either raise your hand with a blue hand, that probably now everybody knows uh, through Zoom, or uh, write your name or write the question also on the chat. If you um, have a question that is specifically for someone then please also let us know so that we that we know uh, to whom uh, we should be addressing it um, if you have a question for mr albrich please let us know because he has to leave uh, the meeting at around two um, o'clock so we would then prioritize uh, those questions so do those at the beginning if you have any uh, technical issues during the during the um, uh, event, then please um, just just open the private chat um, and uh, write to the EGPP account. Um, so once again, uh, thank you everybody and thanks especially for um, to the speakers for participating, um, for agreeing to participate in this event. Before I go and do a very short introduction to the project and to our first results. Um, I wanted to introduce our four speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Jan Olbrich uh, has a PhD in sociology and he has been a member of the European Parliament since 2004. And before that, he was also involved in manifold um, uh, academic, political and, so and social activities. He has occupied uh, various, uh, lots of different key posts in the European Parliament, mm -hmm. uh, both in the Regional Development Committee uh, and also now in the Budgets Committee. He, um, he is now Vice Chairman and Chief Whip of the European People's Party Group, and he's also co-reporter on the multi-annual financial framework. So we thought that it could be very interesting to hear from him also uh, how these negotiations are going on um, uh, now that that, uh, that we are um, in these times of pandemics. Uh, the, our second speaker is Mr. Klaus Welle. He has had a very long career in the European Parliament. He was first uh, Secretary General of the European People's Party. And uh, later on, he became Director General, Head of Cabinet of the EP President. And since 2009, uh, has been the Secretary General of the European Parliament. So thank you very much, Mr. Vele, for being here. You, you, I guess you're the perfect pe person to tell us about what has been going on in the European Parliament in these last months and to share your impressions. Uh, professor Adrien Eritier is uh, Emeritus Professor uh, from the uh, EUI. Um, probably most of you know, uh, know her or know of her. She has been one of the leading um, researchers in EU politics and has done a lot of work on inter-institutional relations. So she has, in a way, um, uh, kind of encouraged lots of us to continue working in this area. And that's why we wanted to also have her impressions about what has changed now in this crisis compared to maybe previous ones. And uh, finally, Professor uh, Olivier Rosenberg is Associate Professor at Sciences Po Paris. Uh, he's uh, specialized in legislative studies and he's been also working um, this last month on a project examining the impact of COVID on national parliaments. And that's why we thought it could be interesting also to add this perspective to go a bit beyond um, the European Union and also add this uh, perspective to our uh, conversation today. But before I give them the word, I just wanted to present, uh, present some initial um, outcomes. We've uh, been doing an, um, a survey uh, this last um, month um, and we finished just last week. So the results are basically still very, very preliminary. So uh, we thought that we would just give you a very initial um, 
uh, uh, indications of what we've, uh, we thought were a couple of interesting points. Um, this is part of a broader project that has been uh, financed by the EUI on democracy in lockdown. So uh, looking at the impact that the crisis has had for the functioning of the European Parliament and its influence. Um, and we did now a survey of uh, members and also of um, uh, staff in the European Parliament. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 315 responses, which is not huge, but for this kind of surveys is decent. Um, I mean, the, the main problem we had was that very few MEPs uh, responded. So take the, the, the outcomes of this, uh, of the opinions of MEPs with a bit of care because um, it's only 10 of them. Um, but otherwise, uh, we had quite a lot of responses from the General Secretariat and also assistants and, uh, and the political groups of the European Parliament. Um, one of the things that we were interested in was to see how people reacted to um, the measures uh, taken by the European Parliament when going into um, remote uh, working, so, so kind of having to adapt to a, a new digital um, atmosphere, when, uh, ways of working. And what we see is that most people were actually very positive about the support that the Parliament had given during the lockdown, um, especially in the General Secretariat, people were, uh, were um, said that, that the um, support was excellent or very good. Um, and in general, that was a general trend. And those that were most unsatisfied were either MEPs assistants or, or those from the political groups. But what is probably more interesting, um, uh, yeah, sorry, and then these are just um, some, some, if you want, some positive uh, and negative opinions that we got. Also, we also got some some written responses. We asked people to elaborate a little bit more, and um, and there were opinions that that, that uh, diverge a lot. Some were very negative, saying, "Well, you know, actually, uh, we we have the feeling that uh, the EP hasn't been able to work during this crisis. Uh, that uh, that uh, we cannot communicate." And some people who were uh, saying, "Like, okay, so this has been really well done. Um, it was very quick, and uh, and we know that um, it was a, a lot of pressure." And most people kind of fell in between these two opinions saying, well, we knew that it was difficult and it was good, though there are things to improve. It has been improving over time, but there are still some shortcomings. But as we said, generally, the, the, the response was actually quite positive. What is probably more interesting out of um, the survey is the opinion that people had of um, how the pandemic affected their uh, context with the people that they they usually work with. Um, so we asked them basically, so compared to normal times, how do you evaluate your context um, during the lockdown? And um, probably the, 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 the best context, so that the categories of best context are not so surprising. So for MEPs, it's their assistance. For the assistance, it's their MEPs. Um, uh, for the general secretariat, it's the people inside their, their services, inside their units, for the political groups, it's also the people working within the political group. But I think what is more interesting and probably more important for us to reflect upon is this worst context. So where have they felt really that they've been losing out compared to normal times? And for instance, for MEPs, um, it was other MEPs. For MEPs assistance, it was also assistance of other MEPs and other MEPs. Um, and for the general secretariat, so those who were outside their services, outside uh, or MEPs, MEPs assistants, so outside their, their bubble in a way. So that tells us that there, there's something going on there so that uh, people have been able to maintain contents within the, their bubble, within in their immediate uh, field of, of action, but they, they've lost this um, broader network, this broader area of, um, of context, of uh, interaction, which is essential um, in any parliament, but especially in the European parliament, where we have lots of uh, different cultures, lots of uh, different uh, people working in there. Um, so basically, there's um, even more need for this informal context, for this uh, going together, talking together. So that is, of course, an important point that we might keep in mind um, also for the discussion. Um, and that might be uh, an issue also for the future when it comes to 
um, re restarting normal work. I'll leave it here. Um, if you have more questions about the survey or about our results, I'll be happy to answer them. But now uh, let me stop sharing and then um, start um, with uh, asking uh, Mr. Albrecht. So how has the pandemic affected the multi-annual multi financial framework negotiations and whether you have the feeling that it has made it more difficult for the European Parliament to speak with uh, one voice or to even exert influence in the current um, negotiations and in the current agreement. Mr. Yes. <clears throat> yes, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And of course, for me, it's a big pleasure to share with you some uh, remarks and experiences, especially when we discuss the, uh, the problem of uh, MFF and the recovery fund. And you, you can understand because I'm from Poland, so I have the uh, very possibility to, to observe from the very uh, uh, close the, the, the dynamics so anyway, I think that we, when we discuss the uh, the the the, uh, the influence of um, uh, pandemia on the legislative process, I think this is there are two elements which are important. One is the um, technical. I mean, it's technical in terms of the uh, technical possibilities, and uh, the other one is political one. The technical one, I think, it, uh, this is uh, uh, European Parliament is, is absolutely the front runner now in the world. I think that uh, Klaus Welle will explain it why, with, because he he's one of the authors of the of the this a, a really uh, well done job uh, trying to use all the possible uh, systems which exist. Because I don't know how many system we use. And of course, the, um, to develop also the system of voting and uh, and for, and participating in the different different activities. Let me remind you that today there are no committees and no meetings in the parliament uh, physically. They are only the uh, the online meeting remote system. So I think one is it's really a big challenge. This is the the question of the technicalities. But uh, it's something we, we should learn from because, you know, when you look at the uh, this new possibilities, uh, you can jump from one meeting to another during one minute. Even in the parliament, uh, it takes you about 10 to 15 minutes from one, uh, from one meeting to another. And you can jump from one meeting to another and to another to another. And in effect, this is the this new technical possibilities. They are changing the habits. I mean, the, the members are, are, are participating. I think that the participation of my colleagues in the meetings are much better than normal. I mean, yeah. it's better than in the normal times. The people, they just sit and they, they, they observe the whole, the, the whole meeting. So I think this is a very interesting influence of the technical, new technical possibilities and the possibility to, to meet someone very quickly. It's like the... Uh, uh, when you make the very quick uh, uh, meeting, you need the opinion of somebody and you can make it uh, during uh, one minute to, to, to have the people from several countries at the same time. So probably this will stay. This will stay uh, uh, because some of, the, some of the activities probably will use this possibility. It's like recently we organized a meeting with the national parliamentarians and it was very efficient because national parliamentarians, they stay at home. And we, we made the meeting with them and uh, even their participation is, was much better than uh, comparing the situation they were coming to Brussels. So I think this is a very, very interesting uh, process and this is still developing. And I think this is still making better and better. So I think we will have the very interesting results. Politically speaking, it's different because politically speaking, uh, you, you have this, uh, the, first the problem of the legal element the legal is uh, what about the decision made by the parliament with the members are not present so this was the politically very complicated situation so that's why european parliament uh, had to add some elements to the legal base of our state because it, it, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the rule of procedure because if not the question can appear after three five years is what about our decision was it legal or not no matter if it's in the corona crisis or not, was it legal? So I think that that's why this is one of the most important problems. So some of the members, they are saying that politically, it should be very clear if, if this is the 
in terms of um, importance and the legality is the same like the decision made physically by the members who are present. So this is first. Secondly, politically speaking, of course, the, the members of the parliament, like all the parliaments in the world, they feel that if they are not present, uh, uh, their work is not, uh, is not uh, seen as, as a kind of activity. So they want to be, uh, to, they want to have their activ activity very visible. So and the, the only way, for example, during the plenary session is to be physically in the room or in the, in the Bureau of the Parliament in the capital cities. So I think that, that that's why there was a very clear demand from the members that it's impossible to, uh, to deprive the members from their, um, uh, their, uh, 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 like the, their uh, possibility to, to take part, to, to fulfill their job. I mean, to, to make the job very, very concrete. So that's why the members, they are protesting if there is the, any element for um, depriving them from the possibility to come. We, we had in the last two or, or three uh, weeks, you can say, why can they, cannot they stay at home? This is different because, you know, during the plenary session, very often the, the members, they speak not only to the, to the other members, they speak to their voters because they speak to their voters on the plenary session. They make the, they make the film, they, they publish it. Very, that's why, because they speak in their own language. So if they don't speak during the plenary session, they cannot speak to their voters in, in such a way. So I think that this is very important that the members they think that this is a part of their job. So I think this is, politically speaking, is, is very important. Third element is the, the question of the negotiation, especially on the MFF and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, and the, the fund. One thing which is very interesting, because I started to work on this two years ago. Two years ago, we, we had several presidencies. One, one of the presidency, it was Finnish one. In fact, they, in fact they, they even say, we don't have time to come to the parliament. Let's make our uh, uh, preparatory meetings with the council on the, uh, on the remote system. It was before the corona rises. So the Finnish, they propose us to make the remote uh, working uh, method before the corona rises. So, so it was like, we were, we were uh, uh, to be very diplomatic, we were not very satisfied. We say, why don't you come to the parliament? You have, you have one, uh, 500 meters. And they say, no, 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 we, it's a waste of time. Let's make it digital. So it was before the corona rises. But, but ne next, when we started the negotiation, of course, it was the hybrid system. Some of us were in the room, some of us were on remote, but to be very frank, it didn't work. It didn't work. I mean, the negotiations, in fact, require uh, the presence, the physical presence. Why? Because it has a very specific dynamics. It has the dynamics and this is the, uh, the, the situation of the quick response, quick reaction. I mean, immediately um, uh, agreement between the, the members. So in fact, I, for, because I had to make the quarantine because of one of my assistants, so I had to stay at home. And I took part, I think, because Tilo Bauer is here. So I Tilo remember one of our lawyers from the parliament. So, uh, so the, uh, I had to stay at home and I took part in the negotiations uh, uh, online. It was not good. You know, because my colleagues, they took part in the debate and I was waiting that someone will give me the floor. So, so because this, even with the best possible system, of course, if, if everybody is online, everybody with the new system, which allows to take part is, is okay. But the hybrid system, it's, it's completely not possible. So I was immediately after the quarantine, I was back to the physical presence in the, in the negotiations. And of course, the, this was the, the only way because you know, Negotiation is about psychology, is about reaction, is about the contact, is like the face to face. This is a, you, you, you don't know where is the point that you have to attack or the point that you have to resign. So uh, that's why the, the, that's why the uh, European Parliament, the, ex, the uh, uh, one, uh, in, uh, the possibility to be physically is only the trilogues. And the trialogues and this kind of negotiations, because I think the parliament understands that this is much better. So I think, in fact, the coronavirus didn't have a real influence on the on the nego negotiation. Of course, 
all the preparatory meetings among us were on the online, but it was like everybody was online. So uh, all of this was is when we meet our president of the parliament, uh, discussing the our strategy, it was online. This is possible, but the negotiation as such, negotiation should be absolutely physical. So I I, I think that um, uh, and we we hope and just because I'm looking at the and my watch, so my time is over. But I think that. I hope that there will be no veto and that we will not be back to the negotiations because uh, uh, th this, is, this is a clear disaster uh, uh, provoked. But, uh, but just to answer your question, I don't think that the, um, that the coronavirus has a real influence on the content, on the content, no, but the, the, because the, the negotiation has a sp very specific character. So, but uh, of course the result for us is good but what will be the final result, we will see. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Velle, so as, as we were saying, you, you've been um, in charge of leading many of these uh, changes. So what have been the main challenges for, for the internal organization of the European Parliament? And what are the main lessons that we can draw now from this uh, process of uh, change and adaptation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. We have, um, I think we've had from the beginning of March a very clear strategy with three targets, which we wanted to reach all of them and not alternatively. One, to protect members and staff. Two, to assure business continuity. And three, to show practical solidarity. Protect, it's clear, because members and staff cannot risk potentially their lives when working or <clears throat> working for the European Union. But business continuity was also crucial because if the European Parliament had not been able to take decisions, it would have meant that the European Union would have not been able to take decisions. And that would have a, had a disastrous effect uh, on credibility of the, European, uh, of the European Union, especially when it came to the very early decisions on support. And practical solidarity, because we thought that we need to show solidarity with the communities we are living in, that means in Brussels, in Strasbourg, and in Luxembourg. So that meant that we had to take bold decisions very early on. We decided, for example, in March uh, to advance our investment program in IT from a program until 2024 and do this in three months. We all together bought and distributed uh, 10,000 um, hybrid computers. So everybody in the parliament in a couple of weeks and months was distributed with a hybrid computer. Uh, we increased our outward connections by 10 or um, 15. Um, and this was crucial for protection. And on the members side, business continuity meant that we had to come up with a linkage system that allowed committees to continue, leadership organs to continue, the plenary to continue, uh, and all of this with interpretation, because it's not like a Zoom, you can run a Zoom meeting, we have to work in multiple languages, and that system simply wasn't available. So we had to develop it um, over a couple of weeks with the Latvian upstart, and we have been uh, connecting, I think the latest figure was 130,000 people in these kind of conferences, thus ensuring that our normal work um, could continue. And of course, voting in plenary from a distance in a secure way, because without voting, we couldn't, wouldn't have been able to take decisions. Maybe the most, um, let's say, unusual or bold decision was to show practical solidarity. So we offered to our host communities, Brussels, Strasbourg, and Luxembourg, for example, to provide meals for people uh, who are homeless, which were prepared in our canteens altogether, 2,000 meals a day until last summer, 200,000 meals. Um, we were driving doctors and nurses at night to hospitals in Brussels, because otherwise they had no transport capacity. We provided in our parliament the place for test center, COVID-19 test center in Strasbourg. And we wanted to do all the three things, uh, all the three things together. And uh, that has led, for example, to a situation where I had uh, different conversations with chairman in the US Congress, uh, who are looking for uh, an exchange of experience, how we have been doing, how they have been doing. And um, I think we are perceived as an organization which has efficiently uh, managed that situation. Crucial, 
IT capacity. So basically advancing our investment programs from which were meant for four years to a couple of uh, months, but also interpretation, because we cannot function without interpretation. And that meant that a lot of uh, dogmas had to be put into question, like uh, on remote participation, for example. Traditionally, interpretation is provided to the people in the room. But here we had the members maybe sitting under their roof a couple of thousand kilometers away, uh, which means that for interpreters, it's more difficult to do, uh, to do the job. Uh, so uh, uh, let's say um, long-held convictions had to be uh, put to a test. Of course, we have also been meeting different interests. Uh, when it comes to our members, it's a different situation when you're living in Brussels and you can just walk into Parliament, or when you are living in driving distance and you can easily drive to the Parliament, or when you're rather far away and you always need a flight, which, by the way, during large parts was not available. So uh, these create different interests and therefore partly also um, tensions. And also, um, of course, we have the difficulty. We have uh, three different sites, Luxembourg, Brussels, Strasbourg, with different legislation uh, concerning the COVID, but also different infectious situation, which changed all the time. And um, uh, we could not come back to our um, plenary site in Strasbourg. So that was also raising issues between Brussels and Strasbourg and how do we how do we handle that? <clears throat> what remains, I think, for after are um, basically two issues. First question, how do we how will we practice teleworking in the future? It's clear that we will be more open for teleworking in the future than we were before the crisis. I think there will be a certain entitlement for teleworking for staff. Of course, it's up to the Bureau, but it's my intention to propose that. But also flexible regimes for uh, staff uh, in case their services agree, and it's uh, in the interest of that service. But as uh, Jan Olbricht has also correctly mentioned, we will also have to reflect which meetings can in the future be remote. And we see there are clear advantages, for example, when we want to have high-level speakers, uh, it's one decision for somebody sitting in the United States to take a plane and fly over and then have a one hour intervention or for that same person to be able to intervene uh, via remote. So I think there are definitely advantages we have discovered, which will also form part of how we are working for afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, this is really interesting. I think that, you know, if, if people have more questions, they can pick up on some of these points because uh, probably, you know, there, there are many points that are still open and that can be of interest to the audience. Um, Adrienne, um, you've been observing interinstitutional relations for a very long time. What do you think that, that has happened now? So how has this pandemic affected um, interinstitutional relations? And how do you think that might, it might change the balance of power in the future? Um, thanks very much, Adrian, Aria, not, uh, for inviting me to give my thoughts on these questions. And I would like to ask two questions. The first one is, which has already been touched upon, what were the institutional or organizational adjustments of the parliament in view of the crisis, living in the crisis, and how has it impacted on interinstitutional relations? So. Looking at the first aspect, how does the Parliament as an organization logit logit logistically adjust to this challenge, new challenge? We heard about video conferences, problems of multilingual interpretation, uh, resorts uh, to remote voting, and also what was mentioned by Olbricht that um, there is a certain loss of informality, and or, as mentioned by Ariadna too, in her survey results, uh, that there is a less, uh, there are less possibilities of informally interaction in the corridors, which in the cafeteria of the European Parliament, walking in, in the hallways and just having a short chats and discussing issues is, I think, plays an important role in the European Parliament in finding, in forging decisions. 
so what also has come out in the research, for instance, by Rossack and Fenner, uh, regarding the capacity of reaction in terms of working in the three institutions, that is Parliament, Council and um, Commission, they say that what is has a sh what came out, which I found an interesting result, is that the Commission and the Council were in a, in a sense where could react a bit faster because they could kind of break up into smaller work formations. For instance, Goret Baer in the case of the Council and the Commission having all these kind of smaller groups which they could kind of get together in order to discuss what the reactions are. Uh, of course, um, what is obvious too, and was mentioned earlier too, is the plenary not, not taking place means, of course, less open debate. And that the fact there were, there were no discussions in the plenary now on what all these pandemic and the dealing with the pandemia means uh, with the, for all of the citizens in the European Union. Now, as regards interinstitutional interaction, uh, what has come out also in the uh, so far existing research is that there clearly were much less trilogues uh, than compared to the year 2019 um, in the same period. And of course, for obvious reasons, because there was so much pressure to act, uh, the decisions uh, went down in speed enormously. And if you look at the figures of, for instance, presented by Ondarza, uh, it's, it's a drastic uh, cutback in times of going through the entire decision-making process in spite of, since 2019, as uh, relative fragmentation in the political groups in the European Parliament. So one would say uh, quite a lot of performance. Of course, time pressure also that the opposition and the other ages, I mean, the opposition in the sense of no, the co legislators, opposition or not opposition, had a very little time to react. So there were much less amendments. And I, I mean, one assessment was, came to the conclusion, it was what a lot of confirmation of what came out in terms of legislative proposals uh, or uh, rubber stamping in the months of, in the early months of COVID. As regards the oversight functions, there was certainly less debate and less Q&A with the commission in the beginning. Um, but that changed then over the months and uh, the questioning of, on the part of the European Parliament vis-a-vis -vis the Commission and, the, and also the ECB, for instance, increased clearly. Um, now, as we look at economic, sorry, I didn't, I should mention also uh, the scrutiny in the context of hearings, which picked up again uh, in the period uh, April to July, which were kind of focusing on how COVID was managed, picked up quite clearly. So looking at now economic legislation, because as we all know, actually the supranational powers as regards public health are minimal, are marginal. So in a way what happened is the economic reaction to the pandemia. And that's where the action played. And if you look at now, what was the position of the European Parliament in these economic big legislative um, packages or pro, uh, acts, we have sure where the EP was formally not involved, an implementing decision by the Council. We have the European Stability Mechanism where the EP formally is not involved. It's an international treaty outside of the treaties. Uh, of course, in the case of the actions of the ECB, very important. Again, in the PEP pro uh, program, there is no right of oversight of the Parliament on the shaping of this uh, program. And now, of course, we have, and we already talked about it, and Ulrich mentioned it, now the scene of the Parliament has come with recovery fund on the MFF. 
Here, of course, the parliament is fully involved through the budgetary powers, and it has used this power uh, with, uh, by proposing important resolutions. It has proposed and was successful in achieving, obtaining a higher budget. It has been insisting on new own resources, which is an issue which is still being negotiated and discussed, but in one form or another will come. And of course, it has insisted on the rule of law mechanism and linking it to the benefiting of the uh, recovery fund, which is, as we know, ongoing as a negotiation process. But interestingly, um, overall, if you look at the, politi the political in the political negotiations, were led by France and Germany, of Germany and France, in an alliance with uh, the Commission President. So, uh, as has been asked by Keilinger, the Commission Council rollback against his EP. Do we see that? Do we test? Are we seeing that uh, evolving now? Because, as we kind of showed in our book of 19, 2019, that the Parliament has made enormous. Um, advances and has enhanced its own position as regards institutional power in a variety of areas, even when it did not have formal powers by using particular types of strategies. And what we are seeing now evolving in the uh, negotiation of the MFF is clearly this delaying strategy and issue linking strategy, which is one of the strategies which the parliament in the past has used, uh, the EP has used very successfully in order to extend its formal powers and informal powers, institutional powers. So that's what left. we see now. That, how, how long did you say? Two minutes left. Yes, that's fine. So yes, the parliament um, is using fully now this leverage in the negotiations of the MFF. And it will be very interesting to see what the outcome is and whether uh, uh, Hungary and Poland are making some concessions and what are the concessions we will have to make. But, but uh, at the end of the day, of course, at times of crisis is also always the hour of the executive and the agency power. And if you look at now the programs which uh, will be come through, the control of the implementation of the Recovery Act will strengthen clearly the Commission. Uh, now there have been a lot during the entire crisis, and that is again a favoring of executive and uh, power, is there have been non-legislative responses to the crisis, and of course less legislative acts because everybody was busy with COVID. And of course the ECB under the program, uh, the economic programs has further increased in importance. So what we have seen as outside of a legislative framework, if you want to, institutional innovations on the part of the Commission, the clearinghouse for medical equipment, and this interesting kind of configuration of Commission Capitals Network, that is these information channels which have been created between the Commission and the national ministers. That, of course, then uh, Sorry, that of course then creates problems for democratic legitimation, as uh, we can imagine. But let me just mention one aspect of digitalization, which Giancarlo Villela has worked on a lot. Uh, digitalization also op opens a new opportunity for the EP, MEPs to strengthen their roots in their constituency, uh, changing the role of re representatives and citizens because there has been a lot of arguing in the past that in, uh, as compared to national parliamentarians, European parliamentarians don't have strong local roots. And that could be changed now with this jump in digitalization. So to conclude, yes, it's the hour of the executives and there are implications for democratic legitimation. But I think with uh, the normalization, uh, and the restrengthening of the uh, will happen of the parliamentary forces at the European level, EP, but also linked to the national parliaments. And at the very end, I just wanted to briefly present our book. Oh, I'm sorry, that's still upside down. 
anyway, the uh, book we uh, uh, wrote and published in 2019, August 2019, on the strategies the European Parliament uses in order to widen its institutional powers. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Adrienne. I think that you've raised a lot of important points about um, not only uh, this, this question about whether the EP is now limited to uh, rubber stamping or not, but also what happens, I mean, what are the implications of this in the long term for the legitimacy of the, uh, of the European Union's uh, political system. And now uh, Olivier has already very kindly pre uh, um, uploaded his uh, PowerPoint and so that, that's basically um, and as you can see he's going to look also at uh, national parliament and I think that this is an important uh, question right so how going beyond the European Parliament so what how, how does the European Parliament compare to national parliaments and what can we learn from each other so Olivier the floor is yours Olivier, we can't hear you, or at least I can't yes, hear you sorry. now. <laughs> I'll be brief, uh, because I, I, I know we want to, to ask questions. So we did um, a survey with uh, colleagues from um, Sciences Po in Paris and from uh, Israel. We compare basically all uh, countries of more than 1 million inhabitants in the world during the first wave of the COVID. And we ask experts to put uh, um, a mark to each parliament on two scales. One on the functioning of parliaments between one and 10, 10 being, being business as usual and one being closed because of the, of the COVID. On another scale based on the use of um, electronic device with full virtual meetings and uh, remote votes even uh, with, with the not of, of four. And we did it well, um, believe me, scientifically with, with uh, double checking of experts uh, ranking that. So I go quickly on the, on the results. This is a scale for one, this is a scale for the second. So results, not very interesting here for, for us today, but still I, I can mention it. The fact that of course, full democracies were the most active legislators during, during the crisis worldwide. But a bit surprisingly, the lower um, marks are for intermediary countries in terms of democratic development, which um, may be interpreted by the fact that in this country, the uh, authoritarian um, responsibles may uh, have taken advantage of the, of the crisis to uh, silence their legislators, whereas legislators were, were less an issue in full dictatorship. Um, well, that's a bit surprising, but, but that can be explained. And of course, it is reflected in the averages by um, regional zones. If we look at the use of electronic devices, again, there is a greater use in full uh, democracy, democratic system, which of course may be also uh, correlated with the level of um, um, economic development and the possibility to afford these uh, devices, laptops, uh, uh, etc. It's um, um, again reflected in regional uh, zones with um, parliaments in South America, Europe, and Oceania, Oceania ranking better. Now, if we go um, into details um, regarding the situation of uh, parliaments worldwide according to both scales, so you see horizontal acts functioning of parliaments and vertical one acts use of technology, you see that the average for the national parliaments in the EU, we put aside Malta and, and Luxembourg for the comparison because they were not populated enough. This average rank um, on the average in the EU 25 among both the most uh, active legislators in the world during this, this uh, first wave, together with other, other countries, as you, as you can see, from Tunisia to uh, the US Congress. But as well, uh, European um, parliaments in Europe also rank among the greater use of um, uh, digital devices, together with, uh, as you see, countries like Australia and Canada, in, um, not, not only, you see Argentina, New, New, New Zealand. 
And from what we've heard today about the European Parliament, well, unfortunately, we didn't rank the European Parliament in, in comparison of national legislature, but the EP would be very close to this point of EU 25. 25. Now, let's go within this uh, average and look at where each national parliament uh, locate in itself uh, for those two uh, axes. If we look first at the um, axes and the functioning of parliaments, well, first, we don't see much. There is no correlation with, for instance, the deepness of the disease. For instance, you see that Belgian parliament was open, uh, whereas the disease was very, very, very high. There is neither correlation with the strength of legislatures. We calculate for it, and it does not give anything. There is no correlation either with the use of uh, technologies, with the second acts. In other words, at the level of, of, the, of the 25 member states, the, um, the correlation is, is very um, uh, limited. The, uh, well, one observation we can make that is that as a whole, uh, countries in Northern Europe, parliaments from Northern Europe tend to be more open and active during the crisis, which can be relates to the strong uh, democratic commitment of these con this countries that we know from international, classical international comparison. We also see that the so-called illiberal democracies tend to rank high. You see for Hungary, you see it for Poland, uh, for Romania to some, uh, to some uh, extent. And um, well, it's, it is probably that in these countries, the parliamentary majority was not a threat, was not an issue for the leadership of the prime minister. And therefore, when we question the uh, rule of law issue, which is, as you know, a very hot issue, it's clear that the consequence is, is, is more for the functioning of justice than of, uh, of legislature. If we go now to the second axe on the use of technologies, clearly there is a, a plus or a greater capacity to use them in some Eastern European country. You see, you see that uh, the most active e parliaments were in Romania, Latvia. Latvia is well known for its commitment uh, with uh, women e-democracy for, for a decade. And, and, uh, and Poland. It's interesting uh, for comparative uh, scholars because usually uh, uh, Western Europe is a kind of, of, uh, of role model in terms of uh, democratic development. Well, the picture here is a, is a bit different. Um, we have two minutes left. Yes, I've nearly finished. It also seems that the so-called working legislatures as opposed to talking legislatures, so, legislatures that are based on uh, um, intense work within committees rather than plenary speeches, these uh, committee legislatures tend to be more uh, active in using uh, technologies on, as well in, in, in remaining open. Well, um, to conclude what we see with this very quick uh, sketch is that the very dark picture that we have read in the newspaper saying uh, with the COVID, it is the end of parliamentary democracy, etc. Well, it's not true. And parliament has a, maybe surprisingly a great capacity of adaptation. That's also a part of the story of the, of the, of the EP. Yet, this is a, a first, a first approach because in details, when we look at what was really done within parliaments, we see that there was very innovative activities related to oversight activities, questioning topical debates, but um, of course, greater agencies to the profits of the executive power regarding lawmaking, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I think this is this indeed fits very well also with what we've been observing and it raises also very good questions about agency within parliaments and um, also about this working uh, parliaments and the need to uh, make uh, committees and legislation continue uh, working. I'll leave now the, the word to Alfredo, who's also going to chair the Q&A session. 
So, Alfredo. Okay, thank, thank you. First, I invite uh, the ones that want to ask questions to raise their uh, virtual hand and uh, signal the questions, uh, and I will leave the floor. But I want to start putting a question that can be addressed uh, both to Mr. Olbrich and Mr. Belle, saying that uh, in the last 40 years, uh, uh, many changes happened in Europe uh, and uh, uh, of course, in the European Parliament, uh, the competence and organization changed uh, dramatically, but something uh, has remained uh, quite stable, uh, and uh, this is the calendar of the Parliament. Uh, so the calendar of the Parliament is a structure, uh, more or less, uh, let's say, with uh, the division in weeks, uh, the same way it was uh, uh, 40 years ago or even before. So what I want to ask is, uh, do you think that this uh, experience uh, uh, we can uh, lead to a change of, uh, of uh, presentation of the ca calendar, as already partially mentioned by Mr. Bell, creating uh, maybe new space for hybrid meetings uh, where uh, or uh, uh, expert uh, debates or scrutiny sessions even uh, that can be used uh, during uh, uh, weeks uh, or constituency weeks or weeks, uh, the green weeks uh, during uh, the parliament. And uh, maybe ask Mr. Aubrey, so that then we can uh, it can be liberated for his next meeting. Uh, thank you. Yeah, j just very short reaction. I, I think I'm in the I'm 16 years in the parliament. I think that the system we have is uh, quite well organized. So I think the the very because this is a, a kind of logic in the system. It's like the uh, first the political groups we are discussing next it goes to the uh, committee. The next it goes to the to the plenary session. So I think that it's it should be kept, no matter uh, the conditions outside of the parliament, but of course with small small changes which are necessary uh, to make the system a little bit more flexible, but for the time of coronavirus. But I don't think that we should change the system because it has a certain internal dynamics. And I think this is uh, something we should, uh, uh, we should continue. Thank you. Klaus, I don't know if you want to react to this. My pleasure. Yes, with, uh, with pleasure. I um, Let's say on the calendar, we have adapted the calendar and the crisis to use all the time, including Mondays and Fridays, including so-called turquoise weeks, which were there for constituencies. But I agree with Jan Olbricht that this calendar has a logic. And the logic is that the groups would like to scrutinize what is coming out of the committees. So therefore, the committee should normally meet first and they need to establish a joint position for plenary and therefore a certain uh, sequencing is logical. Uh, but on the wider issue of, uh, let's say, whether we are still innovative, I would just like to hint at three things. Uh, first, um, we did prepare this legislature uh, with uh, documents for every committee on so-called instant legislation where we put together legislative demands from parliamentary committees of the past legislature. And these were presented to incoming commissioners. They made commitments on those and all of those commitments are permanently scrutinized by committees. Secondly, we got in this legislature new by commitment of the president elect at the time von der Leyen, the right of legislative own initiative Right now, we have 16 legislative own initiative reports, uh, let's say, in the process in Parliament or party already submitted to the Commission. Uh, that will be a very important uh, interinstitutional innovation. And um, I know uh, in the past, uh, Alfredo had more responsibility for the budget uh, in Parliament, but still I would like to say that this MFF negotiation under COVID conditions was probably uh, the most successful over several decades. I can only agree on this. I have a few requests for the floor. I will ask Olivier Costa from the College of Bruges to, to put his question. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Alfredo. Uh, this is a question for, for Klaus, uh, for Klaus Vela. So uh, the COVID has been a tool of forced modernization in, in many contexts. For instance, in academia, it has forced the profs to start the remote teaching, the hybrid meetings. 
the use of new tools. We're all involved in three meetings every day. So what will be the consequences uh, on the long run for the European Parliament? So I understand that MEPs are really, um, would be very happy to go back to the traditional way of doing things, but what would be the consequences for the staff and can we foresee more flexibility in the work of the EP, thinking about the calendar and maybe the seat issue? Thank you. Uh, sorry, before going for the answer, maybe if there are other questions, especially address it to Mr. Olbrich. So I see uh, uh, Laura Landorf and then Adrienne. Yeah, and then Adrienne. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for all the presenters for these uh, interesting um, talks. So I, I start with my question to Jan Olbrich then. Um, and that um, links a little bit to um, your task in the European Parliament as the chair of the Urban Intergroup, uh, if that if I'm not mistaken, because I did some research on intergroups in the European Parliament and linked to the observation by Adrienne that there is less space for informal talks, interactions of members of the European Parliament during these times. I'm just curious to hear how is the intergroup doing and how are intergroups doing in the European Parliament? Um, uh, during or in these days? That will be my question to Mr. Albrecht. And I have a question to uh, Mr. Klaus Weller as well. So with this, I thank you later. And then maybe Adriana has another question for Mr. Albrecht. Thank you. Yes, my question is, since you are in the front, you are participating in the negotiations now of the MFF. Can you say along the communication channels you have described now, under COVID, how exactly does it play out now in trying to find a compromise with Poland and Hungary and Slovenia, I think, as regards the question of rule of law and uh, the Recovery Act? How does it play out? That's one question. The second question also to Albrecht is, um, when you said we can hop from meeting to meeting now because we do it digitally, isn't that also, couldn't that also be a loss of quality? Because if you, you know, have a contact one minute with one in a different meeting and one minute extend with another member of the parliament, what can you really say? What can you really achieve in such a short exchange? Okay, maybe Mr. Albrecht, so then we can free you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, first, first, the, uh, if I think this is a loss of quality, no. No, I don't think so. We are learning. We are learning. So I think that the uh, uh, when I when you have um, we have to when you have to make the message very clear through the internet, you have to be well very well prepared. You cannot just make the uh, long speech and saying about well, nothing. Just I think this is uh, I, what I observe is uh, we we don't uh, lose the quality of the meetings. It's like the you know the amendments. Uh, what you said at the beginning, so it's and the quality of resolutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The first first approach I remember it was like, like let's make the text very simple, no, no amendment, etc. After several months, you have the uh, resolution or the legal text with 200, 300 amendments, like always, because the system is much better. So the system allows to uh, to. To, to develop. So I, I don't think that this is really a loss. This is a loss of in, in, in informal context. This is clear. But you know, I, I remember I remember the time when I was the uh, sociologist at the university that we were thinking at the time, if, if the uh, digital is face to face, uh, this is a new face to face, uh, new, new, new type of inter, interpersonal relations. And like what we speak about the intergroup, we were waiting several months, but now uh, two days ago, we organized the first meeting of the intergroup and there was 80, 80 people uh, participating very actively. I mean, this was, it was a proof that everybody was waiting. And of course the, the, the meeting was extremely interesting. And I think that we will now uh, uh, make uh, much, much more meetings like this. So I, I, you know, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think that the, uh, everybody's learning. I mean, we are learning how to how to behave, and if you cannot choose what you prefer, you 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 have it, and you have to 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 develop what you have in your hands. Uh, and uh, the last reaction uh, before before I leave the the, the the room, sorry, this is the exactly how to to hop from one meeting to another, and 
I, I'm sorry, I cannot say you what is the uh, state of negotiations now be, be, in, between Poland, Hungary, and the uh, and the, the council. Because the, what we uh, uh, see now is just official exchange of letters or declarations or something, or everything which is behind is just hidden. I mean, it's just hidden. And nobody is now speaking about what is going on. Now, of course, the, the declaration of Polish and Hungarian government are less and less brutal. They are just like, let's find something, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what, what I can say, but this is a purely political fight not only uh, about money and not only about the rule of law. This is about the future of Europe. This is about the new system of own resources. Because the, you have the uh, uh, Orban and some people in Polish government say, we don't need the uh, recovery fund. We don't need the credit in the EU. This is exactly to block the whole reform of EU. Because as you know very well, to create the recovery fund in consequence can facilitate the own resources. So the, the EU will be different. So if someone was trying to make the veto, it's not only veto because I don't like the rule of law, I will give you the veto because I don't accept your direction of developing EU. And I think this is much more complicated, but I, uh, uh, I don't see any other uh, information about the negotiation and the coronavirus inference. This is just, everything is hidden now. And I, I'm really sorry, I'm at your disposal next time or any, any meeting on the parliament, but now I have to, have to leave. And I would like to thank you very much indeed for the possibility. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry with the, with the Ermela, Jana, that has another question. I don't know if she wants to intervene uh, nevertheless afterward. But for the time being, I will give back the, word, the floor to Laura Landorf and then Will Lemon for uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, Laura. thank you very, thank you very much. Just very briefly to Klaus Welle, um, the discussion about we had a uh, discussion about um, the European Parliament having a seat in Strasbourg and Brussels, and uh, the moving circus, so to say. Um, the current development that you actually couldn't access Strasbourg during COVID nineteen is that in one way or the other kind of moving the entire discussion either to actually in favor of having one seat in Brussels or keeping the two seats? Any any developments on that from your perspective? Maybe William and then we go the floor to Mr. Valer. Um, Alfredo, I would have a question for Olivier Rosenberg. Should I ask it now? Uh, maybe we will give the floor to Klaus Valer now, so then uh, we continue later. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Uh, first, um, I would like to confirm that um, uh, I think the argument of Madame Eritier is right, that uh, loss of informality is a loss of quality. And that's also why we will, to a huge extent, go back to past practices once the crisis is over, because exactly this informal exchange of information is very, is very important. And uh, it's not the same quality if you just can meet uh, digitally. So uh, therefore, I believe we will be in a mixed system afterwards. Uh, but uh, um, informal context, informal exchange of information is very important. Uh, on the other hand, in, in so far as organizational decisions are concerned, I'm not aware of any decision by the Commission or the Council which was taken more quickly than in the European Parliament. Uh, on the other hand, I'm aware of several decisions which were taken more quickly in the European Parliament than on the other side. Start with the test centre, everybody getting a hybrid, entering into multilingual conferences. Um, that was not, uh, let's say, the case so quickly in the other institutions, so I'm curious uh, about the study you are mentioned, and I don't think this will stand a more in-depth uh, verification if we are speaking of organization. Um, we, are we concerned uh, that uh, now uh, the Commission or the Council are becoming more powerful because Germany and France can agree? On the contrary, we are very happy if they are not dysfunctional. We like them not being dysfunctional. We like them to agree. We like that Germany and France uh, take their responsibility. 
And uh, that leads to something, as you have mentioned, in the health area, for example, which I've been calling for some time, complementary executive capacity. So the building up on the European level of executive capacity, where the member states cannot deliver, and uh, trans-border health cooperation is one of those, which is now enforced by the crisis. And like usual, we might need some time to get our control rights, but we will be getting them. So we are not concerned, but we very much welcome this. On the effect of digitalization, I very much agree on your comment. Uh, we've tested this already largely in the last European election campaign. We built up a network with 300,000 people grassroots. Uh, we had contacts with 300,000 people grassroots who we encouraged to run with us the campaign together. Probably not 300,000 people were active, but we are sure that 30,000 people were active. And to have 30,000 people on the ground who send out mailings, who organize meetings, who invite their neighbors, is an army. And that's transforming things. And the other thing that's transforming the European Union is that language as a barrier, which was long time thought to be absolute, is becoming much more relative. Uh, with digital technology, with interpretation uh, programs, with translation possibilities. So for a long time, the position was defended that these 444 million, uh, they couldn't get together, they couldn't exchange. And that's an argument that's increasingly untrue and 10 years from now will no longer exist because digital gives us the possibility to engage uh, directly. So I believe for a European Parliament, that's a huge uh, game changer uh, in our possibilities to connect directly to the citizens and not be dependent on the goodwill of national authorities, which might either be there or which might not be there. For uh, the staff uh, in the future, I believe it's very important that, like for members, we continue largely with a presence regime. Uh, we don't want to go into situations where staff are scattered over the 27 member states of the European Union. We are working here together as European citizens in a permanent exchange, and that cultural effect is very, very important but we can come to more flexible working mechanisms where I believe there should be a certain entitlement during the week, maybe a day or so, where people can do telework uh, because the overall experience both by management and by staff is very positive, but also to offer more flexible and going beyond teleworking possibilities in agreement with the management if that um, is producing uh, results. Uh, the advantages of uh, distance uh, communication on the political side are absolutely obvious when it comes to expertise. Uh, we recently had a conference on long-term trends where we had Madeleine Albright coming in from the United States. She would not have been flying over. Uh, but she's happy to spend half an hour or an hour with us. So I think that will be very positive. And I can also see a big impact for delegations abroad. Uh, if we send delegations abroad, very often they can only be very small, but they have to be accompanied by a whole number of interpreters and other staff. Uh, but only very few members are allowed to travel. So I believe that uh, modern uh, communication technology and interpretation capacity can provide us with the possibility to enlarge our external activity far beyond where we are now. And um, one additional question uh, was asked to me about Strasbourg and Brussels. No, we stick to the treaties. Uh, Strasbourg is the place where we conduct our plenaries if we can conduct them there, which means outside this crisis, and the moment figures are such that we will that we are able to come back in safety, we will be back in Strasbourg. Okay, thank you very much. I have a three uh, very quick questions. Uh, Klaus or Steve from Olivier, uh, Wilhelm and Andrew Portin. Olivier. I have a question. Me, yeah. yeah. I have a question for Mr. Vela. Two questions. 
even if you are very cautious in your answer, Mr. Vele, two, two difficult questions. First, what is your assessment of the automatic translation of uh, virtual meetings without human resources? If it works, it can change the future of, the, of, your, of your budget. Second question, on interparliamentary cooperation, the EP used to have a structural advantage by the fact that uh, national parliaments came to Brussels, to, to your building, with your interpreters, with your clerks uh, organizing it. So it was a, a kind of home game for, for the open parliament. Aren't you afraid that through virtual meetings through, with Zoom, you will lose this, this advantage and be just one parliament uh, among others within interparliamentary bargains? Sorry, Alfredo. Again, uh, I would like to ask a short question to Olivier Rosenberg. Is it the good moment? Uh, no, maybe no, maybe Deirdre first then. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the urgency procedure um, and, and rule 163. Um, Sorry to be stereotypical as a lawyer, immediately focusing on the specifics. Um, but nevertheless, it um, allows a very speedy um, and limited debate and was used quite a lot in the beginning. And there was uh, quite some criticism from MEPs about that, or at least there was some criticism. I wonder if you could say something on, on um, whether on your assessment, how that has been used, you know, throughout the trajectory um, of, of the crisis from the beginning, the early days to now, just very briefly. Thank you. Klaus to answer maybe? Yes. Um, so on these two, uh, on these two question, uh, first question I guess was about um, machine, uh, translation machine interpretation. Um, we are developing that functionality. We have a specific unit already in the translation area, and we are working on speech to text. Uh, but we are seeing this rather as a complementary tool, which makes language services available where currently they were not available, uh, and also for um, people with uh, handicaps to create accessibility. Uh, so it's clear if a text is immediately available and in good quality, uh, that has those advantages. It has also advantages for members because they could, for example, use their plenary interventions immediately if they exist in text for social media or other purposes. We don't see them as replacement of our very high quality services in interpretation, but we see them as um, good enough technology to go into areas which for uh, reasons of resources, we couldn't provide services um, up to now. Secondly, uh, are we afraid that, uh, let's say, digital conference technology um, um, would make our position with national parliaments more relative? No, not at all. Um, we are thinking in the administration already for many years in terms of linking the levels we have uh, nine programs uh, for the reform of the administration running in these two and a half years. One is, I think, in the third con consecutive period, linking the levels. So we want to intertwine systematically the different levels of uh, what you might call the multi-governance uh, levels of the European Union or the Federal Union and link them systematically and this technology gives us the possibility to do this much more often and especially, and that's the most important, bring the sectorial actors into direct uh, contact. Uh, we have gone beyond the phase where it's good enough that institutional experts talk. We need agriculture to agriculture, civil liberties to civil liberties on specific files and regularly and link the national, the regional, the European, and even the global system into one dialogue. So we see this as a huge um, opportunity for the Federal European Union. 
Um, and then uh, what concerns, um, if I understood correctly, because unfortunately I'm a poor former economist, political economist, but uh, not a lawyer, um, for uh, uh, our, our urgency procedures. I can say that we always used uh, the maximum available, but as Jan Olbricht has explained, those possibilities have increased enormously. And in the last plenary sessions, we are basically back to normal. The number of amendments and the number of debates we are now having are comparable to pre-COVID times. So um, when we took the first decisions, for example, to provide the finances to fight uh, COVID or to make some exemptions on um, EU legislation, uh, which was, uh, let's say, hindering the fight against COVID, uh, we had to have limited procedures, but uh, that is already the past. Thank you. Uh, we go now to open the floor for more general questions. First, Bilal Lemon. And then Katerina and Gies. Thank you, Alfredo. A quick question to Olivier Rosenberg. Uh, looking at your penultimate slide, I was struck by the fairly weak position of Switzerland and the UK. Is, there, is this a statistical artifact or is there something more behind this? Maybe Katerina directly. It was the exact same question. I was so shocked. They were real outliers. Okay, so two, two in one, so Gis? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, I still have one question, one final question maybe for Klaus Weller. Um, um, I know that in the beginning of the pandemic crisis, one member state internally expressed some uh, concern that maybe due to the urgency by which many European measures would have to be taken, that the European Commission would resort increasingly to uh, adopting delegated acts and impact and implementing acts really expediently and also propose in new legislation many more discretionary powers to itself. Um, maybe do you have some indications whether or not we indeed see an increase in the uh, institutional autonomy sought by the European Commission? Klaus, do you want to react to this question directly? Um, I have I have no indication. Uh, what I heard during the past months is that especially uh, co repair was feeling uncomfortable about uh, about this, and their own reduced possibilities to uh, impact. But I have no indications. Anyhow, we continue our fight for delegated acts rather than implementing acts. Uh, for example, in the field of exterior, uh, exterior policy. So this has not been a widespread debate in Parliament, um, but as far as I have heard in Council, yes. So Olivier, now if you want to... Yes, yeah. on, on, the, on the UK and Switzerland, it's true that out of the um, uh, 25 best ranked countries in the world in terms of uh, democratic development, uh, there are the two uh, the two outliers. So it, it may partly be a bias due to the, the weeks where we, we made our survey. Uh, but uh, I have another explanation for the UK. I have no for Switzerland, but for the UK, with the fact that it's really what the, the uh, archety archetypical of what we call usually the talking parliament, where the, um, the um, the main the focus is put on the on discussions on, on the on the floor and hence uh, well the fact that there is a, a disease is a the greater concern in such a parliament whereas in others where the uh, focus is put on the uh, working in committees it can it's more doable to to continue to be open so that's my uh, explanation okay uh, thank you i take advantage of my position i have uh, one question and one question for uh, Olivier. But at the end, uh, you are, say, expert, and uh, you mentioned already the, the strategy of Parliament uh, to increase its influence, and you have mentioned that uh, is, uh, is a success in the achievement of uh, MFF and the uh, Recovery Fund. Can you expand a little bit more on this uh, and uh, how you see, let's say, in this new way of uh, relationship between uh, uh, various institutions, this can... Uh, 
expand even more. And for Olivier, uh, you mentioned and then the Klaus mentioned this possibility for a, a closer relation between national parliaments and not on a general uh, aspect, but more on the specific teams. Uh, how you do, do you think that this uh, proposal, knowing uh, with your knowledge uh, of uh, national parliament, can, uh, can be implemented? Thank you. Adrienne, maybe you want to jump in? I was not sure whether you meant Ariadna or me. No, again, you, 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 sorry. Okay. So your question was, which are the strategies Parliament is applying now in the MFF? It's a delaying strategy, it's a cross-issue strategy it's using, and hopefully it will bear on the result. But other strategies, of course, that the Parliament has used very successful is a first mover strategy. It's just trying to do something first, like introducing hearings for nominated persons of an agency, head of an agency, which then, uh, unless the parliament approves of them, would not be accepted formally by the commission or the, or the council. So that was, we don't see this in this particular instance recently. What we do see on the horizon kind of is an alliance with national parliaments uh, as a response to the kind of cutting back of democratic debate and time for amendments, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a, something which is emerging. Yeah, and this is a perfect uh, bridge, let's say with uh, Olivier. So Olivier, you can jump in on this. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to be rather optimistic on the possibility offered by uh, electronic devices on the develop, future development of interparliamentary cooperation. And as uh, Mr. Veda, I think that uh, the important step for the future is to have it policy fields by, by, by policy fields. You know, the national parliamentarians are often uh, frustrated by their trip to, to Brussels because it takes them one day and they can speak for, for five minutes. So um, the solution of, uh, of electronic uh, meeting is a, is a good one, but it is also true that in order to uh, achieve really something, uh, something really important, let's think of the field of uh, budgetary cooperation, etc. at some stage, uh, in-person meetings would also uh, be, be needed. I don't know if there are, there are other questions. I don't know, Ariadna, do you want to say something at this stage uh, before um, are there any other questions i could give priority to those my... no. adrian you wanted to ask another question yes a very quick question to klaus welle and something which was mentioned by olivier too i found this very interesting that you say this is more and more of sectoral or policy specific cooperation across the levels right european national regional local even Yes. But, of course, it would be interesting to hear, is that just an exchange of information or will that you lead to certain decisions and who would then kind of have more decisional weight in that multi-level cooperation? So, Mr. Velle, if you want to answer directly. Yes. Um, I, I would argue I would argue the following uh, already in the current state of development of uh, the European Union uh, the democratic function of the Union is divided between the European Parliament and national parliaments uh, of course when it comes to European legislation it's the European Parliament when we are, we are bringing the Commission into office or if need be out of office but national parliaments have a very important democratic function in, in many, many uh, respects already now, uh, not only when it comes to treaties, uh, but also, for example, in the effective control of their own governments in the other chamber, which is the Council of Ministers, which by some is executed very skillfully. Uh, if we are thinking, for example, of the Nordic parliaments, uh, Finland, Denmark, or also uh, Sweden. That means the democratic control for different issues has to be executed at different level. And therefore we are not competitors with national parliaments. 
but we are complementary in assuring democratic control. The difference we are having is that um, national parliaments are working in a fusion of power system on the national level. That means they're expected to support their governments and if they don't, they are dissolved and there are new elections. Whereas the European Parliament is working in a division of power system, much more similar to the United States system. So uh, we therefore can play a different role whereas national executives can execute a lot of influence and impact on their national parliaments. But nevertheless, it means we have to strengthen ourselves mutually. Uh, I would like to give one example. I'm a deep believer, and that's also what I've tried to do over the last 12 years, that uh, the influence you are having is not just what is in the treaty, uh, but it's largely also... Um, it's largely also determined by the, by the expertise you are having available. And that's why we've tried to increase the level of expertise to our members, for example, with the Parliamentary Research Service. National parliaments have a major problem in that that level of expertise on European issues is not available to them. And therefore, uh, I've asked um, our Parliamentary Research Service to not be only our Parliamentary Research Service, but to also be the research service on European issues for national parliaments, uh, to provide them with expertise, to empower them in their control function of national executives, which in the unique system of the European Union are co-legislators in council. And there's a very practical uh, area uh, where we can work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if there are no uh, more questions, then um, allow me to thank um, everybody, but especially our speakers, Olivier, Adrien, and Mr. Velle, for their uh, very interesting and very insightful um, uh, presentations and for answering also uh, all these questions, which I think uh, have helped us uh, have a much more holistic uh, understanding of um, what has been the impact of the of the this crisis? I think that what is clear is first that we need to look at the impact of the crisis not just inside the European Union or the European Parliament, but in in a more uh, global sense also of context with national parliaments, context with parliaments even outside uh, Europe to understand how um, the crisis is affecting uh, parliaments and democracy in in a um, larger sense but also i think that what what comes out of it is a is a relatively positive uh, feeling and positive message that yes uh, of course the, the the crisis has affected the, the working of the institutions it has slowed down things but it has also opened new uh, windows of uh, opportunity not only now for how things work and for make, allowing parliament to continue to work uh, despite the crisis but also for the future right so new areas of uh, dialogue new opportunities for um, uh, speaking to experts experts uh, speaking maybe to interest representatives for uh, letting um, MEPs, national parliamentarians come together and also maybe uh, create new links also with uh, citizens. So I think that that is something that we will probably need to observe um, in the future and continue to look into in the, uh, in the future. So thank you very much for, um, for um, allowing us to discuss this today. Um, the recording of the session will be available on the EGPP, so on the EUY uh, website soon. Um, and we will also post uh, the outcomes, the outputs of uh, this project, so be it in the form of uh, working papers or chapters or um, other publications then in the probably months to come. Uh, but um, so just keep an eye on it and we will be publishing on the EGPP website. Thank you very much. And please uh, maybe unmute the, uh, the microphones for once and, uh, and let's give a round of applause to uh, our speaker. Thank you. Thanks for that. And have a nice week. Um, and I hope that you know, the, the situation gets a bit better everywhere and that we can see each other soon again. <laughs> Take care. Yeah.